take me back to 2016, an interesting time for cricket in Australia. The Hobart Test has, has just happened and you get the call up for your test debut, a bit of a dream come true. Talk me through what that call was like and that moment was like for you. Uh, I was very surprised because I hadn't probably had the, I guess, the backing and the runs um, as some of the other guys had and talk around the test team leading up to that selection, I wasn't really, didn't feel like I was in the frame. Um, I missed the first Sheffield Shield game through a concussion. Um, I scored, scored some runs in the second one, but then guys like Pete Hanscom was coming off a double hundred in that game. Um, There's probably the days after that where I really got thinking about it and you do question it a little bit. So talk me through the Adelaide test then. <laughs> Yeah, so that went pretty quickly. Um, the night session was in and I think they just taken the new ball. So it was a challenging time um, and to walk out and bat with Uzi. This is not an easy time to come in and bat, by the way. Once I was out there, I actually felt comfortable that I could, I could do a job. Um, and then Rabada came on and <laughs> was all over pretty quickly and I was back in the set shed sitting down. And pulls it! Straight up the Yorker does the job. I remember watching it and we were just sitting there thinking, geez, this is a tough way to make your test yeah. debut. I mean, everyone was still getting used to the, the day-night concept. And obviously, I didn't perform um, in that test match, but you know, it was a pretty eye-opening intro to, to what it's like. And then from there, you never really got going. How tough was it? Yeah, a little bit difficult. So Brisbane, um, disappointed. I missed out another pink ball game, but came in at a very good time to, play, to bat. One I am disappointed about is probably in Melbourne um, against Pakistan. I felt like I missed a really good opportunity. Got him, threw him down the pitch. That was an excellent piece of bowling. And that was probably the one that, that hurt the most. When did you find out you were getting dropped? Not too long after the after the game. Trevor Hone just pulled me aside and it was something I could sort of see coming in a way. From my point of view, I was probably more frustrated myself. Like I said, I missed a pretty good opportunity in that game to try and nail down a spot. So I really understood where they were coming from and it just makes it a little bit harder when it's uh, your lifelong dream gets taken away a little bit. I end up flying out at 6am the next morning and, and playing a New Year's Big Bash game in Adelaide. And straight through Maddinson. Well, there we go again. It's a reckless shot. So the Big Bash didn't go according to plan either. And at what point did you realise you weren't in a great headspace? Um, yeah, probably at moments throughout the Big Bash. I guess it's similar when you hear Olympians say that they, they try so hard and they put their whole life to get to one goal and then when it's over, you sort of don't really know what to do with yourself. I still enjoyed playing and I enjoyed being out there on the field, but just you know the day-to-day -day activities like getting up and going to the gym or um, going in and training um, and just doing those extra little things that I sort of lost a bit of drive to do. I was training in the nets all week leading up to a Shield game, flew down to Melbourne and just in the nets, over the space of about two minutes, I just knew that it wasn't the right place for me to be and I needed to get away and take a break and refresh mentally. So you're literally facing balls in the nets? Yeah. And you just go, I'm done? Yeah. So I was facing balls from Trent Johnson, the coach. I just thought, you know, this is not what I want to do today. So I walked outside the MCG to the, across the road, near Punt Road to the, to the field there and made a few phone calls and then that was when I sort of decided that I needed to step away for a, a couple of games. What was that moment like when you make that phone call? A um, bit of a relief in the end. Obviously being uncharted territory in terms of taking a break from the game, um, I wasn't really sure what to expect or how it would go down. Then called my parents and let them know what was going on and it was just all positive reinforcement so I felt confident I was doing the right thing. I was quite emotional when I was telling my parents, I guess, because to tell them I was going to miss a couple of games um, and I wasn't really in the right headspace to be playing, playing cricket, I think that was probably the hardest thing to tell them but they were very obviously very accepting of it. A few players have come out since you did to sort of admit that they were struggling a little bit, but when you did it, there weren't many that were sort of open about it. Did you worry about coming forward? Yeah, a little bit. I guess probably the consequences of not so... I think the players are probably the most accepting out of anyone. People have probably gone through the same thing and maybe at a um, deeper level than what I was, but I just feel like maybe they do hold back um, not knowing what the consequences will be. Um, as I say, I think the players are always very accepting. It sometimes comes from a little bit higher up that you, you sort of question whether selectors will see it your way and see it the way that other people do. And I think it just brought to the front that, you know, just because we're cricketers and we do have such a good lifestyle and um, lucky to do what we do, that we still, we're still human um, and you still go through 
things that everybody else does. At the time there was a fair bit of media that it was the way that Cricket Australia handled it and, and all these sorts of things. It, was that the case? Do you feel that things could have been handled a little bit better and that test exits in general could be handled a bit better? Uh, from my point of view, not necessarily. I thought it had really nothing to do with what I was going through. Um, I wouldn't have expected anything more than what I received. It was pretty good feedback. Um, maybe in the future or if there's a plan in play, there's sort of a middle person there which can sort of go between, I guess, the, the team and also people transitioning out of the team. Well, Madison advanced. He had enough of the singles and the dots. And that's what this man can do. The exit from New South Wales obviously wasn't what you had planned and, and yeah. didn't go to plan, but you found yourself in the Cricket Victoria change rooms and, and are you happy? How has the move gone? Are you in a, in a good space? Yeah, extremely happy. I feel like I'm thriving in this environment. It's a lot of responsibility placed on the players to get themselves right and make sure you're doing the right thing, um, which is something I like, a bit more freedom and um, you know, to, to train the way I want to and to play feel confident in playing the way I want to as well. When you think back to 2016 and, and everything you went through, do you still have aspirations to play Test cricket for Australia? Yeah, of course. Um, I feel at the time, going through the experience, I sort of know what to expect now. Um, I feel like I know myself as a person probably a little bit more. I understand my cricketing um, a little bit more. So I feel like there's a bit of unfinished business there. I, would like to get back and play and you know, to prove to myself more than anything that I was, I am good enough to get back there. And I understand that that may never happen, but I think it'd be silly for me to give up on that dream at the moment. So um, to get back there would mean everything again.